Now we're going to move into chaining, which is uh, a problem that DES suffers from. Uh, well, I, sh I should say DS suffers from a problem that chaining solves. Um, essentially, the same process is used for each of those blocks in the cipher, those 64-bit blocks we were talking about. And so if you have two blocks that just happen to be identical and you're using the same key, you're going to get exactly the same output. Um, and this is really problematic because it's basically making each of these individual blocks a separate individual message. And that can make it uh, very easy for an attacker, especially for messages that have common beginnings or endings, uh, which happens often in, in real life scenarios. Uh, and then uh, you'd, you'd be much more equipped to figure out what all the middle blocks are by having decrypted the first uh, or last set of blocks. So the solution is chaining. You really want to make the encryption of each block dependent upon the content of the previous block as well as its own content. Um, you might notice that this makes uh, diffusion, one of those characteristics we were talking about earlier about modern crypto systems, uh, more possible. So I'm going to give you an example of why chaining is problematic first, and then we'll show you a little bit of a solution to that. Um, so here's a, a simple chaining that sort of shows the problem. We've got two different messages. This is the message, and then this is the message. You can think of these as transactions. Maybe Annie is giving Brian $100, right? And we'll label this as transaction number one. It happened on August 1st. And then the second plain text message is this one down here. Maybe Carol gives Drew $500, and this is the second transaction also on August 1st. Now the problem is if we're encrypting these and the block size breaks it up exactly as you see here, then when we produce this ciphertext at the bottom, if we start off with just the key and this block, we end up with exactly the same block for both messages, right? And that makes it easier on the attacker because the attacker sees those two things as identical. And they are identical in the plain text as well. Uh, so basically, if the blocks are independent like this, you can modify some of them and, and perform a man-in-the-middle attack. It would actually be possible for me to uh, take something like this, modify it, and feed it into uh, a new algorithm, and then perform like a man-in-the-middle attack. So to prevent this, we basically just create a, an initialization vector that we sort of add into the message as part of the encryption process and then remove as part of the decryption process. Uh, when you're going back the other direction. So in this case, the initialization vector is going to be a randomized something or other, right? And that produces a randomized looking ciphertext, which we can see differs here. And so for those same two messages, this block that was the same in the plain text is now radically different. We have SMD21X and then WD40RT as the output for the second one. And that eliminates exactly the problem that we were interested in. And of course, this is something that AES takes advantage of. Uh, this is essentially the high-level structure of AES. It's much more complicated mathematically than DES, and we are definitely not going to be able to go through all of those, uh, all of the elements that you would see in AES. But essentially, the way that the, the process works is you, it's still a block cipher. You still have blocks. You have the input, the plain text message. And in order to produce the output for each cycle, you have three phases. You have a byte substitution, right? Very common in these kinds of ciphers. A shift or a transposition, right? But this is at the row level. And then a mixing of columns, another perturbation. Now this key is added right here, and this is actually where the key is applied to the message to produce the final output that goes to the next cycle. So very similar in structure to what we saw with the DES algorithm, but in this particular case, it also includes an initialization vector for chaining. And AES is incredibly powerful. It's uh, been around since 1997, analyzed quite extensively, and there have basically been no major serious challenges in practice. The, the only challenges that have happened have been uh, pretty specialized circumstances and relatively theoretical uh, uh, purposes. Of course, that's just what we know about, right? These are all things that we have found. Uh, and have been public knowledge. So it's, you know, I, I suppose a remote possibility that some na nation state has found some way around this. Uh, there's no evidence of that, though. It's, it's uh, about the best security you can purchase. Uh, and s essentially, the underlying structure of AES uh, is such that you could use the same general approach with slightly different uh, keys uh, to produce even more security. So there's no attack to date that's produced any serious question. And because we can add bits to the key, 
it's entirely possible that we can continue using AES for quite some time, uh, despite the fact that many of you uh, were not even around when AES was uh, first brought onto the scene. So that's everything we wanted to talk about with uh, symmetric encryption algorithms. DES, AES are all symmetric block ciphers. You use the same key for encryption and decryption. Um, DES does not have chaining. AES does. Uh, and AES is actually still very much a secure protocol that you can use in practice today.